Heavenly Father, thank you so much for, for giving us your spirit this morning to help us, to comfort us, to reclaim us, to recalibrate our hearts so that we can live from the identity as children of God. Continue to help us do that during this time of preaching as someone needs to hear a word from you, their Heavenly Father. So come, Lord Jesus, by the power of your Holy Spirit. Come with an army of angels to reclaim the hearts of your people. It's in your name that we pray and ask all these things. Amen. I feel inclined to, uh, you know, we're going through the sermon series on Acts this morning, and um, I just feel inclined to say to somebody, and maybe I'm the somebody, that you are accepted. The whole time during worship, I, I was just sensing that someone needs to hear that word this morning. You are accepted. Not accepted um, because you cleaned up and put on church clothes. In fact, sometimes I think the fact that we have something called church clothes gets in the way of helping people hear and understand the gospel. You are accepted as you are, not as you should be, because you'll never be as you should be, but God accepts you right now the way you are in your hidden life, in your at-home life, the life that you are afraid to have anybody ever see, the life that perhaps you are concerned that if someone would find out, they would be ashamed. You are accepted. That in and of itself is the gospel message, that God accepts us as we are. If you look in the Bible, you'll see this replayed over and over and over again. When the prodigal son came home, he didn't stop at, um, you know, Macy's to get a new outfit because he was going to his father's house. He didn't stop at one of those travel centers uh, to take a shower and clean up because I want my dad to, uh, to think that I, I actually made something of myself. But he came home stinking, perhaps with flies hovering around his head, just like that, a complete wreck. And what did his fathers do? His father ran to him and embraced him. He accepted him. The Holy Spirit wants someone to hear that message this morning. You are accepted as you are. And for all of us, who perhaps are trying to be accepted as we think we should be, the Spirit wants you to hear the message, stop. God doesn't meet you where you think you should be. God meets you where you are. God calls your name, and oftentimes the reason we don't hear God calling our name is because we're trying to live according to another name. So let this space I pray to God that increasingly, not only this church, but all churches can become a place of real people, with real sinners. Any real sinners in here besides me? <laughs> I mean, I'm not talking about the kind of sinners who, uh, I didn't read my Bible this week, Pastor. I didn't pray this week, Pastor. Any real sinners? This should be a place of real sinners because Jesus came for real sinners. Jesus didn't come for fake sinners. Jesus didn't come for people who uh, forgot to pray. Jesus came for the broken and the bruised, the neglected, the downcast. And the good news of the gospel this morning is that if you are a real sinner, then there's a savior who's available to meet you and he will be the one responsible for bringing you in life to the place that he wants you to be. Indeed, that's the story of Peter in this gospel, in, in the book of Acts, isn't it? 
I'm not going to read the passage, but it's too long. I hope you read it before coming, Acts chapter 2, verses 14 through 47. But in this passage, we see a Peter who 50 days ago approximately was denying Jesus. Remember, they were outside by the fire, and the little servant girl said to him, you know, you were one of his disciples. And what did Peter say? It says he swore and made an oath saying, I do not know the man. That's real Peter. The fake Peter was the Peter who said to Jesus, even if everybody denies you, I'm not going to deny you. Even if everybody neglects you, even if everyone else runs away, I'm going to stand by your side. That's Peter as he thought he should be. But the real Peter was the cowardly Peter. The real Peter was the guy who when the fire, when the temperature increased a little bit, he's going to do what's best for himself. That's the Peter that Jesus actually wanted. He didn't want the Peter that was going to put on a facade. He didn't want the Peter that was going to put on a brave face. He wanted the cowardly Peter. And now in this passage, 50 days later, what we see is what happens when Jesus gets a hold of a real person. Because Jesus got a hold of this coward who couldn't even tell a group of people, yes, I am his disciple. Now this same man is standing in front of at least 3,000 people to say, yes, I am his disciple. What happened? Jesus got a hold of the real Peter. And as we look at this passage, we'll see, and I hope you'll begin to think, if Jesus could do this in the life of Peter in 50 days, then what will he do with my life if I surrender to him, if I come to him as I am and not as I should be? What will he do in my life? In the passage we see, If you remember from last week, the apostles, there are 120 people that had received the gift of the Spirit, and they started speaking in tongues, um, and that is speaking in the language of the people that were gathered around. The last thing we heard is that, is this statement where people accused them of being drunk. And so Peter, being a man whose life has been seized by God, whose life has been seized by the power of the Holy Spirit, he now seizes this opportunity to bear witness to the same Christ that he couldn't bear witness to approximately 50 days earlier. And so Peter stands up and he says to everybody, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you. Give air to my words, for these people are not drunk as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. That was a joke by Peter, by the way. It's not funny to us, but he was making a joke. We don't get drunk this early in the morning, but if you stop by at maybe like 8 o'clock this evening, you know, then maybe there'd be a reason uh, that we're speaking in language that uh, at that point nobody else would understand. But then he goes on to explain to them what it is that they are hearing and what it is that they are witnessing. And so what's going to be important for us to understand this morning is what was important for the gathered crowd to understand. What was the gift that God poured out on those 120 disciples on the day of Pentecost? What was the gift? The easy answer is the Holy Spirit. That's correct. But there's something taking place here that's, that's, that's pointing to how God is bringing about a new creation, how God is making all things new. So let me read what Peter said to them. In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I'll show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. And it shall come to pass, it goes on to say, that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What does it mean when God says, I will pour out my spirit? What is spirit? 
What is spirit? Spirit is liveliness, right? When we say uh, someone has spirit, we mean that this person, this person is not just alive, but they are alive in ways that it looks like they have an extra helping of liveliness. They're alive with, with vim and vigor. So when God says, I'm going to pour out my spirit, you should think the thought that God is saying, I'm going to give my liveliness to the world. I'm going to give the world the part of me that makes me lively, that makes me creative, that makes me innovative, that makes me powerful. I'm going to pour out my spirit with liberality on all the world. Spirit is unembodied personal power. It's not like, um, like the force from Star Wars. The force from Star Wars is unembodied non-personal power. That's why you can use it for good or for evil. But spirit is unembodied personal power. It's alive. And so, it, and so God's saying, I'm going to give my liveliness to those people so that they can work in cooperation with me to bring about the things that I and they want to happen in the world. That's what spirit is. So when you think of spirit, think of liveliness. Think of the stuff that, the, the characteristic of life that makes one really be alive. But what does the spirit do in this passage? What does the spirit enable? Well, it enables prophecy. Well, what's prophecy? These are old school words that unfortunately they've been around so long that um, we kind of, we think that uh, to prophesy means to say something about the future. And that's included in prophecy. But when the Bible refers to prophecy, it's, it's simply referring to what happens when the word of God is spoken. So anytime a God communication is taking place, that's prophecy. And in this passage, it says that sons and daughters will prophesy, meaning that sons and daughters, little children, will speak God's word. It says that young men shall see visions, which means that they'll see God's word, and old men shall dream dreams, which means that they'll perceive the word of God. Now, why is this important? Why is it important that on the day of Pentecost, God poured out his spirit, his liveliness, enabling people to interact with his word? The reason it's important is because God's word is powerful. How did God create the heavens and the earth? By speaking. So you see what God's doing here? God's saying, I'm going to give you my word so that you can speak forth a new creation into existence so that your sons and daughters can bring forth new creation, that, so that your elders can perceive a new creation, so you can have visions of a new creation. And by giving you my spirit, you can embody this word that has creative power and become a new creation in the world. That's what those people were witnessing on the day of Pentecost. They were witnessing the word of God taking a hold of people and accomplishing things that they thought before then to be impossible. That's how God creates. He creates by speaking, and so he pours his spirit, his liveliness upon human beings generously in order that we can participate in his salvific plan of recreating the world by interacting and acting upon the word of God. Are you interacting and acting upon the word of God? See, you know, I mentioned this last week. Sometimes I think Christianity, like the, the biggest issue with Christianity is that we don't know, we don't know the power uh, that is available to us. You know, we don't know. We think that the power is in our ability to um, gather together as a community or pull together our resources, you know, or use our influence to reach out to other significant people in the neighborhood and make things happen. We think our power essentially is the power of any other movement or any other organization that seeks to do good in the world. And that's all true. 
But in addition to that, the Bible is painting this picture that suggests you also have the power to speak God's word, to act upon God's word. And when you do that, God will partner with you and bring forth into reality the, the very words that you're speaking with him. You know, a few weeks ago, I was invited to speak at this event on um, racial justice. And the conversation was, one of the questions was, what can the church do to bring about um, racial justice, to participate in that conversation? And it, it occurred to me in that moment, in the book of Acts, there was racial tension, right? I mean, Jews and, and uh, Gentiles weren't necessarily eating together, right? Because Jews thought Gentiles were unclean, you know? Jews would not, if a Jew drank out of the bowl that a Samaritan provided, they would have to go through a ritual process of cleaning themselves up. Why is it then that in a short amount of time, we see in this gathered Christian community, Jews and Gentiles, people of all nations and all tongues and all languages and all tribes meeting together, the word of God. They're acting upon the word of God. The word of God that says to them that your identity is no longer uh, the region that you happen to be born in. But your new identity is based off of what I say. And I say that through Jesus Christ, you are now my son, my daughter. When, when God says that that's who we are, it completely overwhelms any other identity, right? So that's why in this community, we saw that immediately people who would not hang out with one another because of ritual uncleanliness began hanging with one another. Why? Because another word was spoken that says, you are one in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I looked at these people who were, who were asking the question, and I said, if the church is going to participate in the conversation of racial justice in ways that are helpful and wholesome, it's not by trying new things and, and engaging with other organizations that are, that are doing really great things in the world. But the solution is to do the things that the people in the book of Acts were doing, committing themselves to the word of God, embracing the identity that the word of God uh, says that, that is theirs. And as we do that, as we focus on who God says that we are and do the works of God, we'll experience the spirit transforming us into a new kind of people that simply doesn't have time to be separated along the lines of race or, ec or economics or any other thing that seeks to separate human beings. What we see taking place in Acts is the spirit absolutely recreating a community and saying, you are to no longer live according to the, the word that the world has to say about you, but you're to live according to the word that God has to say about you. That's what happens as, a, as, as God pours out his spirit upon these people. He's completely recreating them and inviting them to live in this reality, but to do so according to the reality of the kingdom of heaven. And that's what Peter's telling them on this day of Pentecost. He goes on to explain to them that this, this word that has been delivered to us, this word that's reshaping us and recreating us, this word that's enabling us to do these things that are seemingly impossible, also came before in another form. So he goes on to say, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death 
because it was not possible for him to be held. So what he's saying is, in the same way that you guys are now gathered together because a miraculous deed has taken, has taken place because of the word of God, just 50 days ago, you put to death another instance where God sent his word into the world. That's another way of referring to Jesus, right? Jesus is the logos, the word of God. Peter's saying God sent his word into the world before. And through that word, God did powerful deeds, signs and wonders that you all attested to. And I'm sure as he was saying that, everyone was probably thinking about an instance or a story that they heard of Jesus doing some sort of miraculous deed. Everyone gave proof to the fact that, yes, God did miraculous signs and wonders through Jesus Christ. But then Peter goes on to say, at that point, when God initially sent Jesus into the world, he sent his word into the world, you guys killed him. You killed him. You killed the word of God. And in the same way that they were now tempted to look upon these disciples and say, perhaps they're just drunk. He says, watch out, because you did that same thing with the, with the word of God that was just incarnated into the world. You did the same thing, so pay attention to what God is doing in your midst. And he goes on to, to, to point out another instance in where they took the word of God and just treated it like a plaything. He says, in your very Old Testament that you all give much credence to, through the story of David, David testifies saying that I saw the Lord always before me, and because he's at my right hand, I'll not be shaken. And David himself points to the fact that God is going to bring a man into the world who, when that man dies, he's not going to allow his flesh to see corruption, but he's going to raise him up. And then Peter says to him, According to your word, your word, the Old Testament, it's pointing to the reality that God is going to bring someone into the world that won't see corruption. But he says, you guys think that's David. But we know where David's tomb is. We know where David's body is. David's dead and gone. But this Jesus, God raised him up from the dead. So what he's essentially doing is painting this vast picture where people who know the Bible and they will agree that the Bible is the word of God. They knew about Jesus and they'll agree that, that Jesus did mighty signs and wonders. He's painting this picture and helping them understand that time after time, you have become the kind of people that receive the word of God, but do nothing with it. You despise it. You reject it. You don't build your lives upon it. And now, ultimately, what you've done in Jesus Christ is that you've received God himself in form of human flesh. The word became flesh and came to dwell among us. And he says, you guys killed him. You guys killed him. What he's saying to them is, you as a Jewish nation have become so opposed to God that you killed the very person that God sent and appointed to save you. Now, how would you feel if you're in the crowd that day and you believe that you're religiously devoted to God, but now you see that your entire way of engaging with God is by rejecting him? You reject the, the witness of the Bible. You reject God as he comes in the flesh, and now you're in the process of rejecting God's new way of acting in the world by disregarding these people who've just received the Holy Spirit. How would you feel to know that my devotion has been a sham my entire life? Hmm? The Bible says that they were cut to heart. They were convicted. You bet they were convicted. And we also should be convicted whenever we realize that we're interacting with God in ways that aren't in line with the word of God, in ways that treat God like, it's, like, like, like God is not a very uh, serious or important thing, as if God is not a transformer or a creator and someone looking to make us new when we treat God like he's just a, uh, a charm on our bracelet, something that we just do from time to time when we want to feel particularly religious or something like that. 
these people begin to feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and it makes them cry out to Peter and say, what shall we do? And Peter responds to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you too will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So what he's saying essentially is, although you are the kind of people that reject the word of God over and over and over again, God is the kind of person that gives of himself over and over and over again. So repent and return to him. And the very gift that you now see operating amongst us, recreating us and making us brand new, God will give to you as well. And what happened on that day? It says 3,000 of them became disciples of Jesus Christ. 3,000 people repented and returned and a new creation began on the earth that has continued even up until this day. And I believe that the Holy Spirit is once again waiting for all of us because the Holy Spirit's patient and the Holy Spirit is, is meek. The Holy Spirit will not force us to do anything. But when we decide to do something, then the Holy Spirit will work with us in ways that are impossible. I believe that the Spirit is waiting for all of us to once again interact and build our lives upon the Word of God so that in our company, he can do amongst us what he did amongst these early Christians, forming them into a community that, whose lives are shaped by the Word of God, who identify as people of God, who don't identify by the things uh, that the world values. Look at what they did real quick, and then I'll be done. It says, all who believed together uh, had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. What is that? What picture does that paint? That paints a picture of a people who no longer define themselves according to what they have. Is that a word for 21st century America today, especially in the middle class, where we define ourselves mostly by what we have, by what we drive, by where we live, by our reputation, by this and by that? But when the Holy Spirit took a hold of this community, they started getting rid of all that stuff. Not because that stuff is inherently wicked or wrong, but because something else now defined who they were. And so they saw that everything I have is now an opportunity to live out my identity in God, to help my sister or my brother. That's what happens when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of us. This is why I believe many people are actually terrified to have the Holy Spirit get a hold of you. Because we all know deep down within, that when we come to God, the process of getting cleaned up is going to mean that there's a kind of vulnerability that, that must take place, an acknowledgement that says, yes, I am dirty and I need to be made clean. And so I think that's why many people don't come to God. But we must also look beyond that and see what happens when in humility and surrender we repent and we come to God. He remakes us into his people and sends us out into the world so that others who are lost, who are still defining themselves by things that aren't really important, so that they can come home as well. This morning, the invitation that they had is available for each and every one of us as well. The Holy Spirit is calling us by name, calling us to repent, which means to change our minds about the ways that we think and to think in the ways that God thinks. 
so that the Spirit can come and live within us and begin the process of renewing us and making us whole in God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for pouring your Spirit out on Pentecost that day. And we thank you that you continue to pour out your Holy Spirit on all who, in humble surrender, repent and come to you just as they are. Not the cleaned up version, not the version that made some changes so that we can be accepted, but those that just come to you as they are, as children, without anything to offer in return, except our lives that are broken and bruised and battered. We thank you that when we do that, the same promise that was made to these people will be the promise that we receive. New life, a life filled with cooperative power because of the Holy Spirit. So keep challenging us and convicting us and making it happen amongst us. In Jesus' name, amen.